Irak, Arabien, Syrien, Palestina, Egypt. Within a few days of Canada's declaration of war on the German Reich, the chiefs of staff of the three armed services submitted to the Minister of National Defense recommendations for military operations in the event that a general conflict involving the United Kingdom broke out. The Navy and the Army chiefs urged direct support and reinforcement of British forces. But Air Vice Marshal Croyle, the chief of the air staff, was more concerned with the defense of Canada. He wanted to form 23 squadrons, 17 of which would remain in Canada. The other six, he suggested, would support an expeditionary force. I don't think Coral was against overseas uh, involvement. In fact, you see his mind changing several times in the first few weeks of the war. And uh, when, when he finally comes down one side or the other, it's on the side of having an overseas expansion. But all this was soon pushed to the background. It quickly emerged that the RCAF's main function, at least initially, should be the setting up of the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan. Created in December 1939, after rather tortured negotiations between British and Canadian representatives, the BCATP was a truly massive undertaking. Canada, even then, was interested in the bottom line. Um, once the plan had started, the problem was, could the Canadian Air Force, in its embryo state, run such a huge organization? And indeed, it, it proved quite a task. And for the first two years, a lot of help had to be obtained from the Royal Air Force until 1942, when the first part of the agreement was over, they had a conference and changed the circumstances so that the Canada virtually took over the entire plan. Instead of having British bases in Canada training people as well as Canadian, they became all Canadian after 1952. Not only was Canada an ideal place for it, close to Britain from terms of uh, across the Atlantic Ocean, rather than being as far away as Australia, where some of the training was taking place, southern Rhodesia, where some of the training was taking place, and also, of course, close to the United States, where uh, they could get industrial support for what they were doing. The frost was barely out of the ground in early 1940 when construction crews moved onto the new sites on the prairies and in the sparsely populated regions of Ontario, Quebec and the Maritimes to carve out the runways and erect the hangars. Three and a half thousand training aircraft were required right away. All the planes Britain could spare were shipped over and an assortment of other types were acquired one way or the other. Soon, trainees were taking first flights in planes like this de Havilland Tiger Moth and going on to more advanced single and multi-engine machines. At the same time, middle-aged bush pilots were taxiing non-flying aircrew around the prairie skies as they learned to shoot or take star sights or make crackly contact with their towers. In the spring of 1943, the Flying Control Branch was established in the RCAF. Prior to this, air traffic control wasn't considered as a distinct profession. ATC assistants were from general duty trades, and a pilot was always in the tower to keep an eye on things during flight operations. 31 BC ATP flying units were in operation by the end of 1940, a truly fantastic achievement. The first pilot class graduated in September of that year at Camp Borden. The first observers graduated at Trenton in October, along with the first air gunners, navigators, and wireless operators from other camps. At its peak, in 1943, nearly a hundred flight training schools had been set up across the country. BCATP staff exceeded 100,000, a ratio of 15 support personnel for every one pilot trainee. In the year before war broke out, the RCAF had trained a total of 45 pilots. By war's end, over 130,000 aircrew had passed through the system, 73,000 of them Canadian. The remainder consisted of British, Australians, New Zealanders, and those who had escaped from their homelands before the Nazi occupations. Of all the Commonwealth aircrew trained during the Second World War, 
45% of them flew first in Canada. Without a training scheme of this kind, uh, it would have been very difficult to continually provide air crew for the very heavy demands of the operational theaters, especially in light of the heavy casualties we suffered. The BCATP made, in terms of numbers, an enormous contribution to achieving air superiority. The training of Canadians got better as time went along. Their efficiency got better, whereas the enemy was suffering very heavy casualties himself, and <clears throat> consequently, new uh, air crew were coming into operations with less training, they were less efficient, and you had the double effect of numbers and quality versus declining numbers and declining quality on the enemy side. The RCAF Women's Division was formed in July of 1941, initially as the Canadian Women's Auxiliary Air Force. Its purpose was to train women to take over a number of varied tasks from office support to aircraft maintenance so that men may fly, as the recruiting posters put it. Many women did serve overseas, at RCAF headquarters in London, and on stations within No. 6 RCAF Bomber Group in the north of England. The air defense of Canada should have been dealt with fairly easily. After all, the threat from the air was not significant. The main danger lay in surface raider and U-boat attacks on shipping off the east coast. and the impending Battle of Britain concentrated our strategists' minds and material assistance was sent to Britain with all dispatch. This was the right decision. Had Britain fallen, North America would have had a big problem. The main concern at the beginning of the war was that if we didn't have some kind of defense on the West Coast, the Americans would take it over for us. And there goes your sovereignty. So Mackenzie King in particular was very worried when President Roosevelt would say, well, we're good neighbors and we'll make sure nothing happens to you. Well, he wanted to make sure that, that uh, the Americans wouldn't become too evident there. And there was that constant worry throughout the war of American domination of Canadian presence. So when the threat becomes very clear after Pearl Harbor in 1941, the agreement with the United States allowed for the Americans taking over unified command in case of a direct threat, direct strategic threat. But only in that case, otherwise the Canadians well, the Canadians successfully argued that there was no direct threat on the West Coast. Paradoxically, Canada ended up with too many of the wrong resources. Our home defense fighter squadrons grew far too large. We created a home defense air force that was top heavy with non-frontline fighters, such as these Kitty Hawks. There was no useful operational work for these aircraft, even for part of the time. Our chiefs of staff shared the opinion of the British chiefs of staff that the Japanese would be far too concerned in Southeast Asia, putting all their resources there to be able to do much more than conduct raids against the west coast of North America. In 1941, the Battle of the Atlantic began in earnest, and the RCAF focused on patrolling the shipping lanes to Halifax and Newfoundland. The very active East Coast theater of operations suffered from a shortage of both aircrew and materiel in its vital anti-submarine role, especially as the Battle of the Atlantic reached its crisis in the spring of 43, and the Allies were striving to close the mid-Atlantic gap. Once again, Eastern Air Command's efforts in these types of operations were only partly successful, and their results did not match up to those achieved by Canadians flying with RAF Coastal Command, which they sought to emulate, at that time, the most successful maritime air force in the world. But up until the last two years of the war, 
Canadians had to fly underpowered, ill-equipped machines through some of the world's worst flying weather, trying to provide air cover to Allied shipping and protect it against submarine attack on the western side of the Atlantic. You had five squadrons flying out of Halifax, Stranraas, and they had very little direct contact with the Navy, except that they knew they were supposed to be flying escort over convoys, and this they did quite competently, but there was no submarine threat in that part of the world at that time. When the submarine threat started appearing, then you started to have problems because the Air Force and the Navy remained relatively independent. Um, the Air Force sent its, squad its detachments and its squadrons to Newfoundland and to the Maritimes. Uh, the Navy set up its base in St. John's, and they did have joint operational control rooms, but not until mid-1943, after an Allied anti-submarine survey board had been to Canada and made some severe criticisms of the Canadian system, did, did they begin to work properly together. Aircrew in Eastern Air Command managed to achieve a great deal in spite of these obstacles. They went from lumbering up and down the Nova Scotia coast in planes like these Douglas Digbys in 1939, to striking directly at the enemy in mid-Atlantic just four years later, using the latest equipment in up-to-date aircraft. When the U-boats adopted submerged tactics after the fall of 43, they were once again able to avoid attack from the air, to counter this, Canadian-based maritime patrol squadrons got the famous Lee lights as well as centimetric radar technology for their very long-range liberators. However, the U-boats knew they were there, and the success of our East Coast-based patrols must be measured in terms of shipping that was not sunk, as opposed to U-boats that were. This part of the RCAF's operational history cannot be concluded without mention of what's known as the ultra-secret and the intelligence about U-boat operations which was delivered well in advance from cracking the secret German Enigma codes. Despite this fantastic source of information, the lack of combined operations between the Navy and the Air Force on the East Coast meant that opportunities were almost certainly lost. That being said, by war's end, the RCN's total score for U-boats sunk stood at 28 and the RCAF's at 27.